What's going on, everybody? We are here with a special one today. We got Radar Apologetics, Rabbi Eduardo in the house. What's up? And then we've got brother? our guy Yehuda Yisrael over here. How you doing, bro? Shalom, shalom. Good to be here. Thanks for hosting. Awesome, awesome. So, guys, we have, as you see in the title, an interesting title today um, between two interesting sides today. So, obviously, for those who do not know, Radar Apologetics is a Messianic rabbi, um, and Yehuda Yisrael, uh, are you Orthodox, Rabbinic? Yeah. Yeah, Orthodox Jew. And so the title is... Uh, is Jesus necessary for salvation today? I want to give my guests uh, some time to introduce themselves. I'll let our uh, newest guest go first. Yehuda, go ahead, my friend. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm Yehuda Yisrael. I grew up kind of, I'm a Jew. All my family are Jews. Um, I didn't grow up particularly religious, but later in life, I decided to become more observant. So now I'm a modern Orthodox Jew. And I've just been through my journey of becoming more religious, I have gotten into a lot of dialogues with Messianics, Christians, and I wanted to be able to justify why I would become Torah observant. And one of those uh, paths was discussing why I believe, uh, you know, in, in Torah versus the New Testament. So that is going to be kind of the sharing this debate is going to be kind of an expression of, of what I've learned and why I believe, uh, you know, the New Testament not to be something that that Jews follow and, and why I believe the Tanakh to be true without the uh, New Testament needing to uh, continue something that I don't believe is consistent with the Tanakh. So, sure Look thing, sure thing. This is why this is going to be so interesting to watch and listen to. Uh, and Rabbi Eduardo, go ahead, give us a little introduction, my friend. What is up, everybody? So, my name is Messianic Rabbi Eduardo. Um, I was brought up Catholic, but my family are Spanish Jews from Spain and Portugal, have Jewish heritage. Went back to Judaism when I was 19 years old, Messianic Judaism, of course. Um, I don't claim to be a rabbinic Jew or an Orthodox Jew. I'm a Messianic Jew, so I serve as the Associate Rabbi of Congregation Bethel Gabor in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Have a wife named Amy, beautiful wife, Rabbi and Amy, two beautiful little boys. I have three older sons, beautiful as well, but they don't like it when I say they're beautiful. Uh, you know what I mean? And then I also have a YouTube channel called Radar Apologetics, where I answer the questions of the anti-missionaries, Islam, all these other things as we start to expand. And that's who I am. So thanks for having me. Amen, amen, Chief amen. And Yehuda. <laughs> you know what it is. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's good to have both of you guys here. Like I said, I'm excited for this. We have people in the comment section that is excited for this this type of uh, engagement from the two sides. We don't see uh, a lot of this. It's not that popular for some reason, which is crazy. Um, so I'm hoping that we can actually encourage others um, to start engaging in this type of discussion publicly like this and, um, you know, to where uh, it, it, a lot of people can be um, enlightened on this subject, okay? Um, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's going to be 15 minute opening statements from both sides. Um, and Rabbi Eduardo is going to be going first. Uh, before we go into that and jump right in, I want to make sure to say that if you are jumping in here in the stream and you have not hit that like button, we know that you secretly kiss a black stone. All right. <laughs> so hit that like button. If you're watching on Facebook, make sure you like and react and all of these things. I don't care. Just hit that button. Show the engagement. And also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Radar Apologetics. Like he said, he does this on the regular. All right. So hit that like button. And with yeah. no further ado, <laughs> yeah, you too, Yehuda. Hit that, hit that subscribe button, man. Subscribe to God Logic. Subscribe to Radar Apologetics. You know, no, no exception. <laughs> but uh, with that being said. Well, I meant me, my YouTube channel, Yehuda Yisrael. Subscribe to me too. Oh, you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah. Yehudi oh Israel. yeah, subscribe to subscribe to Yisrael as well. In case anyone has any confusion, this is my actual name. It's not like 
Yehudi Yisrael is some brand or something. So just uh, it's not your rap name. It's not your it's rap my name. Actual name. My parents <laughs> named me this. I'm named after my deceased relative. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, that's good that to know. That. Good to know. All right. With that all being said, and that's the name of your channel. I'm sorry, Avery, but that's the name of your channel, Yehudi Yisrael. Just so that right, they know. Exactly. Yeah. The name of the channel is Yehudi Yisrael. At the end, but yeah, yeah. The, the way my name. Just is so called. people know. Right. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. All right, Radar. Whenever you're ready, I'll start the time. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Avery, for hosting this debate. And thank you, Yehuda, for being here today. Our topic is Jesus necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Today is of the utmost importance. It is the position of the Hebrew Bible that God has made himself known and has revealed himself to mankind and calls man to relate to him in the way that he has prescribed. There does not exist a standard to approach God that is separate from the word which he has revealed. I'm saying that it is the word of God that tells us how to interact with God. I'm arguing today that starting with the first book of the Bible, Genesis, all the way to the book of Revelation, that God has been prescribing his way for people to relate to him in worship and adoration and lifestyle and in holiness, which includes the standard by which we all must be forgiven. We must remember that all manners of approach to God are decreed by God himself. And these manners are called covenants. So in order to answer the question, is Jesus necessary for the forgiveness of sins? We must see what God has said about forgiveness, about exile, about his anointed, the Messiah, and especially about covenants, beginning with the first offense in the garden. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 2. When Adam and Eve broke God's decree, punishments were pronounced where they should have died. The Lord made garments and covered them. It's interesting that some of the Jewish sages have said that this skin could have come from the death of an animal, but the passage is not clear. Then Adam and Eve were exiled on top of other punishments. This is home base problem number one, patient zero, if you will. Due to this, we get the first prophecy of the Messiah. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly, you'll go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And here we go. This is the kicker. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is what the Messiah will come to rectify. It is this sin in this garden that must be reconciled. Are we talking about just hanging out in any old garden? No, this garden is a symbol of the divine presence of God and also symbolic of the intimacy that man was created to experience with his creator. See, God establishes his standard. When man breaks that standard, it is equated with exile and death. Then when it came at the time of Noah, when the world was wicked, God's judgments would be poured out in a flood. Great deliverance to Noah was brought in the form of an ark. Realize it's not skins. That God was progressively moving through history, dealing with the people in a new way. Imagine Noah building the ark and all the people around him saying, how ridiculous you look building an ark. Why don't you just wait for God to cover the world with skins? No, it doesn't work like that. Moving forward in time, we are in the Abrahamic covenant. When God appears to Abraham and makes a covenant, what happens with Abraham? Abraham goes into a deep sleep. The animals are brought to him by Abraham. And then the Lord himself passes through the pieces. Genesis 15, 1 to 18. You can go read it yourself. And the Lord says that he made a, a covenant with Abraham on that day. How was this covenant made? It was made with a sacrifice of blood. Blood is what initiated the covenant. It's how you get into the covenants. Pushing forward to Genesis 17, it expands the desires of what God will do for Abraham due to Abraham trusting in God. He says, you will be a father to many nations due to this covenant. For I have made you the father of many nations. And what is the sign of the covenant? It is circumcision, which is made. There's no other way to do it, but by blood. Need I even speak about the binding of Isaac? His life was as good as dead, but it was spared because another animal stood in that place. Then we find ourselves at Mount Sinai receiving the law. How is the covenant cut? With scissors? No, the covenant is cut with blood. Let me read it to you. Moses, the Lord, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you, Aaron, Nadav, Abihu, the 70 elders. Moses alone comes near, but everybody stays far. Then they, uh, Moses makes an altar. And then what does he do? He takes half of the blood puts it in a basin, and the other half of blood, he sprinkles it on the altar. Then he takes the book of the covenant and, and reads it in the hearing of the people. This is the blood of the covenant. Moses took the blood, sprinkled on the people. This is covenant that we are being initiated in. How is the covenant mediated? And it's with blood. But those sacrifices done in the tabernacle later, 
the temple do not really bring forgiveness of sins. We must understand that we are moving progressively through history as God is dealing with his people. You couldn't relate to God the way God dealt with Adam. You can't deal with God the way he dealt with Abraham. You can't deal with God the way he dealt with Moses. We are moving through history. And many times people want to harp on just the sacrifices. But let me read some verses to you. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. It isn't the offerings themselves that affect forgiveness of sins. Jeremiah 7, 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifice. But he did. The point is, is that he's not speaking specifically about burnt offering and sacrifices. He's talking them to, about them to be faithful in covenant. The blood sacrifices is just part of that covenant, but the initial covenant is made with blood. It's very important. It wasn't the it was the external sacrifice that was leaning the right with the leaning of the right heart towards the governing covenant of the time. Governing covenant is vital. This is language that we'll be using in this debate. The question is, what is the governing covenant today for God's people? It would always hinges on the blood with the, of the governing covenant that was made in that time. So the Jewish writer of the book of Hebrews was correct when he stated, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins because the blood that is shed is the blood that inaugurates the covenant in every governing covenant. But what shedding of blood was necessary for the forgiveness of sin? Brothers and sisters, it is not the Levitical sacrifice. It is the shed blood of the covenant, which was made out of a bent heart to God. Blood is how we get into the covenant, and blood is also what keeps us inside of the covenant. But it is always the blood that initiates the covenant that is the most important thing. See, the context of Hebrew 9 is covenant. It isn't Levitical sacrifices. So yes, without the shed blood of the covenant of Abraham, there would be no forgiveness of sins for the Jewish people because that is how they entered into a covenant by being born to the body of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is even believed. Because someone would ask, what about the other nations? It is a popular thought and well-believed within scholarship that the, and within Judaism that the 70 bulls offered during the Feast of Tabernacles are 70 bulls to atone for all of the 70 nations. That somehow, while Israel is a kingdom of priests, because of the Abrahamic covenant, they are mediating for the whole entire world for them to be made right with God. So yes, without the shedding of blood, the initial blood of the Abrahamic covenant and the blood of the Mosaic covenant, which is what inaugurates us into the covenant, there is no forgiveness of sins. It is not the shedding of the blood of the, what's happened specifically in the temple. Rather, it is the blood that inaugurates man into the covenant with the heart leaned towards God. The blood inaugurates the covenant. The formula for return when one sin is found in Leviticus 26 and only echoes what I am saying here. There is no other way to read this than the way that I am presenting it to you that is consistent with all of scripture. Let's read what it says. From Leviticus 26, 33 to 42, you, however, I will scatter among the nations. This is the promise for God's people that they will be scattered and the land will enjoy its Sabbath because they were not keeping the Shemitah year, the Sabbath years. While you're in your enemy's land and the land will enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days, now listen, these 70 years of punishment, which occurs in Babylon, is the seventh year year when Daniel gets his prophecy. Don't miss this. This is all intertwined. Many people who say we don't need Yeshua today want to look back to Daniel. But what was the hope of Daniel while he was in exile the seventh year awaiting the end of the exile to finish? And look at the formula. If, you, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if the uncircumcised heart becomes humble so that they make amends for their iniquity. And so many people stop here to say, we don't need Jesus. Just bend your heart. Ask for forgiveness. No, let's keep reading. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. And I'll remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. Why is it necessary for him to go back to the covenants made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Because it is in that covenant and in that merit of that governing covenant of the time that they are able to enter into a right standing and forgiveness with God. What is the point of remembering the covenant? That very, very purpose. Why, it can, why can't they just ask for forgiveness? Why does God, the God of Israel, have to recall to his mind 
the blood that was shed with the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's because that is the governing covenant paired with the Mosaic law that was the manner by which man can be made right with God. But what affects it, what is powerful, what really brings the forgiveness is the blood of the covenant that brought them into it. This is God's faithfulness. Why? Because Abraham believed, brothers and sisters, is a precursor to the gospel. So yes, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so this takes me to the main point of my opening statement. The prophets in many places look forward to the seed of Genesis 3 to destroy the work of the serpent and to rectify the fall in the garden. This is the progression of the Hebrew Bible. This is what the prophets are looking forward to. Why is it that many people, and I believe perhaps could be the position of my opponent, have stopped in the prophets, have stopped in the book of Malachi, have stopped at the recounting of Second Chronicles, and are no longer looking forward to what is the governing covenant of today. There is one who was prophesied to be an asham in Isaiah 53, a guilt offering to initiate the new covenant that our fathers broke. The new covenant is made with the blood of the Messiah. This is what inaugurates us in. It's not detached from the Mosaic law. It's not detached from the Abrahamic covenant, but it builds upon it. And man must interact with the covenant that is governing the world today by which God is dealing with his people. OK, while my opponent may agree that sacrifices with heart attitude together are necessary for the forgiveness of sins, we will not agree on which covenant is governing today, the new or what has preceded it. It is the position of the Hebrew Bible that one must operate in the governing covenant of the time we live in, where the faith of Abraham manifested in the blood of the covenant allowed his children and the whole world to temporarily receive forgiveness and mercy. In 2023, I'm unapologetically saying it is the blood of Yeshua, the Messiah, the faithful one, who is the perfect sacrifice and high priest and whose blood we must rely on. So to answer the question, is Jesus necessary for the forgiveness of sins today? The answer is an unequivocal yes. Since the time for the cutting off of the, the Messiah, the expiation of sin and the inauguration of the new covenant has passed, according to the seven weeks of Daniel in Daniel 9. According to Rashi, one of the foremost medieval exegetes, he himself states that the 70 weeks of Daniel takes us to the first century. Mind you, sound the alarm. This is the only explicit time in scripture that prophecy is made about something the Messiah will do, gives a timeline and names the Messiah by name. If there was no new covenant inaugurated by the shed blood of the Messiah in the first century, then sadly there is no Messiah coming. But glory to the triune God, our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus came right on time. And we don't need to look back to older covenants. We can operate in the governing covenant that builds on those that came before, I challenge my opponent to give a clear exodesis on Daniel 9, 24 to 27 and prove that this does not state that the Messiah will come by the first century, to prove that we are not in the time of the new covenant. To win this debate, my opponent must also prove that we can rewind the clock of covenants and do not need to operate in the current governing covenant, which is the new covenant made by the shed blood of Jesus of Nazareth, which will be impossible to do to do due to all the prophecies Yeshua Jesus has fulfilled with the interpretation of many of those prophecies being confirmed as messianic by some Jewish sages of Israel. And with the last two minutes that I have, I will do a quick recap of 12 prophecies. Number one, he had pre-existence, which is goes to Micah 5, 2 and fulfilled in Colossians 1 and Matthew 2. Even the rabbinic source says that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Rashi says in Sanhedrin 98, the prophecy that he will be a prophet, Deuteronomy 18. It is also true that Rabbi Levi ben Gershom says that this passage will be about the Messiah and that the Messiah will be a prophet. Yeshua himself was truly a prophet and prophesied other things. It says that he will be a priest. And this too was a prophecy that had been fulfilled. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls, which predates rabbinic literature by hundreds of years, believed in a priestly Messiah coming. Jesus Jesus comes and is the priestly Messiah. Isn't it so amazing and strange and weird and kind of kind of um, interesting that rabbinic Judaism has virtually stripped the idea of a priestly Messiah from its text? I'm not saying that there aren't those that do believe it, but it has been virtually, virtually stripped. OK, it is not a prevalent idea. If you go up to any random Jew and say, who is the Messiah coming? They will say Messiah, son of David. They will not say the Messiah, son of Aaron or Messiah, son of a priest or the suffering servant so much. It's there, but not as much. And we have to understand that. This is my position. I do believe that we are operating under the new covenant and the way that we interact with God is through that blood of the Messiah. This is why 
The writer of Hebrews is so clear. He doesn't have to go back and offer blood over and over and over and over again for the same sins and the same sacrifices because according to Daniel 9, 24, 27, sin has been expiated and fully dealt with at the time when the Messiah was cut off. The only explicit prophecy where the Messiah is named and told exactly what he will do. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Rabbi Eduardo, for that. Okay, and Yehuda, whenever you're ready, we will begin. But first, let me go ahead and announce for those of you guys who are just hopping in the scene, who just hopped in the stream, please hit that like button so that the stream can be in the algorithm so that people can see this conversation and show you too that this is getting engagement. So if you have not already, please smash, smash, smash that like button, you guys. Let's go. Go ahead, Yehuda, whenever you're ready. Mic, mic check. You can all hear me? Gotcha. Excellent. So thank you, Radar and God Logic, for entertaining this topic. And God willing, this will be a fruitful debate and truth will be revealed more clearly. So just to get started with the topic of the debate, we are discussing whether or not Jesus is necessary for the forgiveness of sins today. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, Hebrews 9.22 states, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This statement is foundational upon New Testament theology to support the widely held belief that Jesus or Yeshua's death on the cross and or the shedding of his blood is the only way for anyone to receive forgiveness and atonement for sin. Many believers in Jesus or Yeshua will further support this by going to the Tanakh by quoting from Leviticus chapter 17, 11, which states, for the soul of the flesh is in the blood. And I have therefore given it to you to be placed upon the altar to atone for your souls, for it is the blood that atones for the soul. While I do agree that blood sacrifice is one way to achieve atonement for a person's sins, I do not agree with the idea that death and bloodshed is the only way to atone for sins, especially as it relates to the exile that we live in today. The Tanakh validates the idea that when there is a functioning temple and a functioning Levitical priesthood, animal sacrifices do indeed atone for sins, just as we read in Leviticus chapter 17.11. However, the, the Tanakh also speaks about times of exile where Israel will be without sacrifices, as it states in the book of Hosea, chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, which states, For the children of Israel shall remain for many days, having neither king, nor prince, nor sacrifice, nor pillar, nor ephod, nor teraphim. And this refers to the current exile that we live in today. And then the next verse says, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and, and David their king, and they shall come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness at the end of days. This, of course, refers to the future Messianic era. Now, once again, and I want to make myself clear on this point, it is my position that in the future Messianic era, there will be a third and final temple from which the future Messiah will reign from and that during this future time, the Levitical priesthood will be restored to its former glory and the sacrifices will take place once again. This is scripturally supported by Malachi chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, where it explicitly states that the Levites will be purified in the future Messianic era and they shall be offering up an offering to the Lord with righteousness. And then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and in former years. This demonstrates scripturally that the Levitical priesthood did indeed accomplish what God wanted Israel to do with regards to the sacrifices, as it states that the sacrifices were pleasing to God at some point in the past. Other scriptures supporting the idea that we will continue to sacrifice once again during the future messianic era include Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, which states, I will bring them to my holy mount and I will cause them to rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Clearly, this is a future messianic prophecy. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 even state that the Tzemach, which refers to the royal messianic seed of David, sometimes referred to as the branch or the shoot. Those verses state that the Tzemach will build the temple. But since we do not have a temple today, as is implied in Hosea chapter 3, verse 4, how are we supposed to gain forgiveness and atonement for our sins? Well, for better or for worse, this isn't the first time that we have been in exile and without sacrifice. There was a 70-year Babylonian exile in between the destruction of the first temple and the rebuilding of the second temple, which prophets such as Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, and others gave us insight into what to do and how to act when there is no temple and no means of doing sacrifices. First of all, 
I'd like to highlight the fact that these three aforementioned prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah, were a part of a righteous remnant of Israel. This is part of what gave them authority in the scriptures and why we trust their words of prophecy to be true. Now, I'd like to highlight a few interesting verses in Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, which describe God instructing Ezekiel to take an iron skillet and lay on his side for a given number of days so that he may bear the iniquities of Israel and Judah. He was instructed to do this for over a year's worth of time. This establishes a biblical precedent for the idea that the suffering of a righteous person can be a means of bearing the iniquity of others. This is further supported by the famous prophecy of the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53, who I understand to be the same servant described in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 3 through 6, which explicitly describes the servant as Israel, who initially toils in vain, but eventually restores the rest of Israel, which will serve as a light unto the nations in the future messianic era. Once again, I would understand Ezekiel's suffering as well as Jeremiah and Daniel's suffering to fit with their apparent toiling in vain as they are part of the righteous remnant of Israel described here who are found throughout every generation, including today. However, none of them appear to have seen the restoration of Jerusalem with the rebuilding of the second temple after the 70-year exile. Now make no mistake, I have no problem with the future Messiah also being a part of this prophecy as well. Yes, that's right. Isaiah 53 too. After all, the Messiah is a part of Israel. In fact, I have no problem with the Messianic interpretation regarding any part of the Tanakh, as all scripture, in a sense, points toward a future Messianic hope. However, it must also be acknowledged that the Messiah's suffering is not the only means of reconciliation of sin, even from a suffering servant paradigm of thought regarding the Tanakh. If Ezekiel can bear the iniquity of Israel and Judah through his own suffering, according to Ezekiel chapter 4, then we must take this into account when understanding who the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 speaks concerning. Now that we have that out of the way, let's go back to Hosea chapter three, verses four and five and answer our original question. How do we return to God if we have no means of sacrifice today? Well, Hosea actually gives us a direct answer in Hosea chapter 14, verses two and three. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take words with yourselves and return to the Lord. Say, you shall forgive all iniquity and teach us the good way and let us render for bulls the offering of our lips. Any way you cut it, the verse explicitly says that God will forgive our iniquity through our words. I don't care how you translate the latter half of the verse, whether it's fruits or paying vows, it just doesn't matter. There is no way around it. God forgives iniquity through our words and prayers. Now, if we go to the, to the actual Torah, it's always good to have a Torah source, right? In Leviticus chapter 26, verses 38 through 45, as my opponent mentioned, God gives Israel specific instructions as to how to reconcile our sins while we are in an exile without a temple. To paraphrase for time's sake, it states that Israel can gain appeasement for our iniquities while in exile through our humbling of our hearts and our confession of our sins. Once again, that's Leviticus chapter 26, verses 38 through 45. This is the formula that God gave to Israel to gain appeasement for our iniquities through our humbling of our hearts and our confession of our sin and our sincere repentance to return to God with our words and prayers, just as Hosea chapter 14 says as well. This again is echoed in Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 10 through 14, which states that during the Babylonian exile, Israel shall seek God with all their hearts and pray to God and that God will hearken to the prayers of Israel and return Israel back to the land of Israel. Once again, we have a formula for reconciliation of sin during times of exile that resulted in the redemption of the remnant of Israel, the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian exile as well. Note that there is no mention of the need for Jesus or Yeshua to die on a cross or to have his blood being shed in order for this to happen. Now, just to address the idea of atonement and how it relates to prayer, I can show you an instance where prayer is actually used for atonement. If we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 18 through 20, we have a situation where the Passover sacrifice is being made during the days of King Hezekiah, and many people from the northern kingdom sinned because they did not purify themselves properly according to the Torah, and they ate of the Passover sacrifice despite this, thereby causing them to sin. It's interesting to note that instead of making another sacrifice to atone for the sins of these people, it was Hezekiah's prayer alone which atoned for the specific sin that these people committed by eating of the Passover sacrifice without being purified according to the Torah. Hezekiah clearly knew this formula of prayer and confession of sin and contrition of the heart to atone for the sins apart from the blood sacrifices. If Hebrews 
chapter 9, verse 22, were a true statement, then we would expect a separate sin sacrifice would have been made on behalf of the sinners. Clearly, this wasn't the case. And God healed the people based on Hezekiah's prayer alone and not a separate sin sacrifice. But it was actually King Hezekiah's son, King Manasseh, arguably the most idolatrous and wayward king ever to rule over Judah, who truly applied this prayer atoning formula himself when he was exiled to Babylon, as it states in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 9 through 13. There is no way around it. It was King Manasseh's prayer and God's acceptance of his prayer, which was what restored King Manasseh to his kingdom and rectified his sin. King Manasseh applied the same formula of humbling his heart and confessing his sin, just as prescribed by the Torah in Leviticus chapter 26. And most importantly for this debate, no blood sacrifice was needed for Manasseh's prayer to be accepted by God. Once again, this is in contrast to Hebrews 9.22. Manasseh didn't need blood sacrifice to be restored to his kingdom, and nor did he need Jesus or Yeshua's blood to be shed on his behalf for God to accept his prayer and restore him back to his kingdom. So going back to Hosea 3.4, what does this mean for us today? We don't have a king or a sacrifice. So how do we apply this formula for, to our own lives today? Well, Daniel the prophet also lived during the Babylonian exile. And according to Daniel chapter 6, verse 11, Daniel prayed three times a day and faced Jerusalem even in the face of death. Yet God spared his life from the lion's den. And Daniel is even recorded in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, as being righteous. Yet Daniel didn't have a temple. Daniel didn't have a sacrifice. And most importantly to this debate, Daniel didn't have Jesus or Yeshua to die for his sins on the cross. Yet Daniel is recorded as being righteous in scripture. How is this possible? Simple. Daniel knew the formula for forgiveness of sin through prayer and confession of sin and the humbling of the heart and repentance that has been echoed through the aforementioned scriptures of the Hebrew Bible. This is the example that we follow during our current exile with the future hope that just as the righteous remnant of the generation after Daniel was able to go back and rebuild the temple, so too we hope to return through our prayers and repentance so that we may ultimately fulfill Israel's role to be a light unto the nations in the future messianic era, just as the servant Israel is described in Isaiah chapter 49, verses three through six, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses one through six, which prescribes the same formula of returning to God through following his Torah, which we already know is through sincere repentance and humbling of our hearts and returning to God with all our heart and soul through our heartfelt prayers and confession of sin, which will result in the final ingathering of the exiles. And then the Lord your God will circumcise your heart in the heart of your offspring, that you may love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul for the sake of your life. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. If this sounds familiar, it's because it refers to the famous new covenant of Jeremiah, which will occur after God gathers us to the land of Israel. And at that point, all of Israel and Judah shall know God, as it states in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor or shall one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from their smallest to their greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will no longer remember. Clearly, none of this was accomplished with the death of Jesus and the shedding of his blood on the cross. As evidenced by myself and my opponent trying to teach each other to know God as we speak in this very debate. This demonstrates that Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 is indeed a false statement. And there are other means of forgiveness of sin outside of blood sacrifice. And of course, the death of Jesus or Yeshua on the cross. Thus, we can see that the core theological claim of the New Testament regarding Jesus or Yeshua's supposed sacrifice on the cross being the only means of forgiveness, atonement, and salvation for mankind is patently false. How do we trust the New Testament when it makes such a serious theological blunder? We can't. On the contrary, according to the Tanakh, the messianic era that we look forward to will be brought about through our sincere repentance and confession of, of sin and humbling of our hearts, described over and over again as the tried and true formula for forgiveness of our sins during the time of exile that we live in today. I would like to conclude with Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, to highlight our messianic hope for the future third temple. I will bring them to my holy mount and I will cause them to rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. May it happen speedily in our days. Shalom and thank you.
Thank you so much, Yehuda. All right, so now we are going to move into our five-minute rebuttal sections. We have over 220 people watching us live right now, so please come on in, guys. If you have not already, hit that like button, smash it, do whatever you got to do. Just make sure you hit it so that it, we can be in the algorithm and you two could see that we're having a good discussion because a lot of people need to see this uh, this type of video and this type of discussion, okay? So if you have not already, please hit that like button. doesn't matter which side you're on. Make sure this video gets into the algorithm. All right, five-minute rebuttals. Let me set the timer whenever you're ready, Rabbi. All right, Yehuda, thank you for that. And thank you again, Sheikh Logic for uh, holding it down, my brother. I appreciate that. So Yehuda has missed the point of this debate. Okay, the debate thesis is not, have there been multiple methods of sacrifice in Israel's history? Um, yeah, prayer has been that. Ezekiel bore the burdens of the people. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. There have been multiple methods, but those methods were operating under what is the governing covenant of that time period. So Ezekiel and Moses and these people, they were operating in what was the governing covenant. The question, the thesis for this debate is, is Jesus necessary for the forgiveness of sins today? What is missed is, did Yeshua inaugurate a new covenant? And if so, how is it that one can reject that and move forward and act as though they can operate in that which is before? If it is the position of rabbinic Judaism and traditional Judaism and the position of my opponent, that Jesus is not the Messiah, thereby not fulfilling any prophecies, and then they attempt to go back, I believe they are missing the whole entire point. If Jesus is truly Messiah, if Yeshua is the Messiah, if he fulfilled the prophecies according to the Hebrew prophets, according to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which we have not received a proper exegesis of that passage, which is what would be necessary for him to win the debate, the timeline of the Messiah is set. It's very interesting to me that he came out and said that the reason we're debating this issue proves that the Messiah is not here, where there's no explicit statement inside Scripture that when the Messiah comes, there will immediately be peace on the earth. There's only one prophecy in the whole Hebrew Bible which says the Messiah by name will do X, Y, Z. Everything else is open for interpretation. Timeline, David, seed of the servants, Zimach, branch, all this stuff is interpretive. But we don't see him mentioning Daniel 9, 24, 27, the words of the prophets himself, but rather we hear conjecture about what he believes Daniel was thinking about when he prayed for forgiveness. This for me is an error and a folly. Daniel himself receives the prophecy of the timeline of the Messiah, Daniel 9, 24, 27, and it is irrefutable that that timeline of the Messiah has already passed. So it's either the Hebrew Bible is wrong or Yeshua is the Messiah. If he's not the Messiah, then there is no other Messiah. From Hosea 6 and Jeremiah 7, 21, clearly it is not the sacrifices themselves that the God of Israel was looking forward to. Rather, it was hearts leaned towards him operating in, yes, you got it, the governing covenant the question is the question isn't can people suffer to atone we have this imagery all over the place that's not what the issue is the issue is what is the governing covenant if the timeline of the messiah has passed and yeshua fulfills those prophecies and he came at the timeline that he was supposed to then he inaugurated the new covenant with his blood so yes he is necessary for to, for the forgiveness of sins remember what i said to win this debate my opponent must prove that we can rewind the clock of covenants if the clock of the new covenant has started then we cannot jump backwards into the mosaic covenant we can't jump backwards to the abrahamic covenant they're linked and intertwined but we can't say oh in the mosaic period you can't say oh i just want to operate in the abrahamic covenant you can't say in the time of david no I don't care about having a king. I just want to operate in the mosaic law. You can't do that. These things build on top of each other, and you must operate in the reality of the governing covenant. And it's a bottom line fact that Yeshua is that Messiah. He inaugurated that time period. It's very interesting. He quoted Leviticus 26, just like by um, just the way that I predicted. And he only quoted the first part, but he didn't quote the end of it, which says, yes, they will. 
um, come in, their hearts will be mended. They'll come with circumcised hearts and God will forgive. But it doesn't, it's not read like that. Read the end of Leviticus 26 and specifically verse 42 says, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I'll remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. Why is it important for God to remember that? Why doesn't God just say, poof, you're forgiven because God is a God of justice and order and he operates in covenants. So the covenant with the blood that was shed originally with Abraham it was the governing covenant and in the Mosaic law, that covenant with the governing covenants that man had to operate in. You couldn't pick one or the other. As God progressed through time, they needed to operate through that. So it is also bent heart with operating in the covenant, which is the blood that was given initially. Since we're in the time of Yeshua, forgiveness is found in bending the knee to Yeshua, bending hearts to Yeshua and operating in the covenant that was inaugurated with that blood. With my last 10 seconds, he did again fumble the ball, which most rabbinic Jews do, and I say that with the utmost respect. He doesn't understand the timeline of the coming of Messiah. Within the traditions of Judaism, there is a quasi-redemption. Just go read Zechariah 3.8. The Messiah himself will be like the priest who will mediate for his people, and that's my time. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Eduardo. So we got um, Yehuda, your turn with for the... Rebuttal section, whenever you're ready. Mike check, you can hear? Yep. Great. So my opponent's position is that Yeshua's death on the cross is the only means of forgiveness of sin today. In order for me to prove my case in this debate, all I have to do is demonstrate that there are other means of atonement and, atonement and forgiveness of sin today, according to the Tanakh. And in my opening statement, I've already done that. I showed that the prophet Ezekiel was able to bear the sin's of Israel and Judah through suffering. I've demonstrated how this fits with Israel being the servant of Isaiah 53 and how the servant of Isaiah 49 verses three through six is the same servant as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who will ultimately be a light to the nations in the future messianic era. Remember the verse says, he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will boast. I've demonstrated that the Tanakh provides an alternative formula for reconciliation of sin during times of exile, which includes confession of sins and humbling of the heart and sincere repentance through the following of the Torah. Clearly the prophets like Daniel, who lived during the Babylonian exile, didn't need the blood of Jesus to be shed on their behalf in order to achieve righteousness. So why can't we apply this remedy for forgiveness of sin during this exile, just as the Tanakh prescribes? We can, and the Torah even tells us exactly that. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 10 through 14, when you obey the Lord your God to observe his commandments and his statutes, chat, statutes written on this Torah scroll, that when you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, for this commandment which I command you this day is not concealed from you, nor is it far away, nor is it in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven and fetch it for us to tell it to us that we can fulfill it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who can cross to the other side of the sea and fetch it for us to tell us that we can fulfill it. Rather, this is very close to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can fulfill it. Once again, notice that Jesus' death on the cross is not necessary in order for us to, to perform these commandments of the Torah properly. If my opponent wants to argue other, otherwise, then he will have to prove that according to the Tanakh, that the only way for mankind to receive forgiveness of our sins is to believe that the bloodshed and the death and or resurrection of a supposed sinless man is the only way to receive forgiveness of sin. Clearly, God says otherwise, according to the Tanakh. And just to reiterate again, my position is that during times of exile like today, we do not need to rely upon the blood sacrificial system of the temple to receive forgiveness and atonement for our sins. However, I do believe that the sacrificial system will come back once again in the future messianic era, as I've already demonstrated using scripture from my opening statement. This will happen after Israel is gathered back to the land and God circumcises our hearts, just as Deuteronomy chapter 30 states, and this is the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. For this is the covenant that I will form with the house of Judah after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law in their midst and I will inscribe it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The primary difference between the Mosaic covenant and the new covenant of Jeremiah is that God himself will put the law on the hearts, all of the hearts of Israel so that we will not have to teach the law to each other. You see, under the Mosaic covenant, we are required to teach the law to each other. And I believe Deuteronomy chapter six, verse six through seven demonstrates this most clearly. And these words, which I command you this day, shall be upon your heart. So the Mosaic covenant is also a covenant of the heart. 
But here's the difference. And you shall teach them to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on your way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Contrast this with the next verse in Jeremiah chapter 31 regarding the new covenant. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor or shall one teach his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from their smallest to their greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will no longer remember. The shedding of Jesus's blood and his death on the cross did not accomplish any of this regarding the future promises of the new covenant of Jeremiah. Once again, if Jesus's blood shed and death on the cross did accomplish this, then my opponent and I wouldn't be having this debate now and other Messianic Jews, New Testament believing Christians like Dr. Michael Brown, Chosen People Ministries and One for Israel wouldn't be trying to teach Jews to know Jesus or Yeshua who they claim to be their Lord and Savior. In other words, if the new covenant were actually fulfilled by Jesus or Yeshua, then we wouldn't need Radar Apologetics or any other apologetics organization to, de to teach Jews to know the Lord. For we would all know the Lord from the greatest of us to the least of us. Instead, the New Testament's testimony of Jesus or Yeshua simply serves as a useless spiritual placebo that doesn't fix the problem of sin in the world today. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. With time to spare, too, man. You guys are good with this. All right, so the next section that we're going into is my favorite section of all time. We are going into the cross-examination, 10 minutes each. So it'll start with Rabbi Eduardo, who will be asking the questions to Yehuda, and Yehuda will be answering, and, this, and then vice versa. Yehuda will also get 10 minutes to do the same to um, Rabbi Eduardo. Uh, just before we go into this next session again, guys, hit that like button. We have about 250 people watching now, so let's make sure we get the likes up so that we can uh, make sure the video is in the algorithm, all right? If you're enjoying this conversation, please take the second right now. Take the second. If you haven't already, take the second to hit that like button if you're enjoying this conversation, if you're being blessed by this, all right? Okay, without further ado, 10 minutes to cross-examination. Rabbi Eduardo will be going first whenever you're ready, my man. Thank you so much. Yehuda, how are you, brother? Shalom, shalom. Great. Great shalom. Good, man. Thanks for being here, brother. I have a question for you. A few questions. But when God called Noah and told him to build an ark, would it have been appropriate for him to ask for skins to cover the people of the world the way that God did in the garden? Why, why not? Um, I mean, would it have been appropriate? I mean... You're basing this off of, I think, what you mentioned earlier. I just answer the question, brother. You know what I mean? It, yeah, why, yeah. Why not? Would it have been a, I mean, it's a vague question. Like, would it have been appropriate? I mean, I wouldn't, uh, if, if, if you, I mean. If, so let me rephrase. Why did Noah have to build the ark? Why couldn't God just make skins for the whole world? Why couldn't he make skins for the whole world? Yeah, because that's what he did in the garden. That's how he dealt with sin in the garden. Why can't he deal with sin for the whole world the same way he dealt with it in the garden? Right, right. So, I mean, I guess in theory, that could have been a possibility if you wanted so to. So it would have been okay? It would have been okay for Noah to say, no, I don't want to build an ark. I'd rather have you make skins for the world. I think the point you're trying to make is that he had a specific No, no, please answer the God. question, brother, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, he had a specific command from God that he needed to do in his time, right? That's so he had to follow God's command. Right, exactly, time. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. when God called when God called Abraham and said, Go from your place to where I show you, would have been would God have been pleased with Abraham saying, Nah, I'm just gonna build an ark? Why or why not? Right. Yeah. So I agree within the time frame that these individuals are we're in, we're in agreement on on this general point. Please, that, just answer the question, my yeah, brother. Yeah, please. I agree. He, it would have been he he is following what God Although it's interesting because he does oh, question. Please, brother, God. please answer. Oh, no, no, why I am, would it I be? am asking the yeah. question because Abraham, he does question God at one point, but you, you know, it's Saddam and Gomorrah. But aside but from But it wasn't that, okay for him. Yeah, but that's different. I'm talking about why couldn't he say, I want to operate in the Noah, Noah right, covenant? Because he's operating within the context that God commanded him. He had to operate in the covenant of his time, correct? Exactly. When Moses, when God called Moses out of the burning bush and told him to go to Pharaoh, would it have been okay for Moses to say, nah, I'd rather sacrifice my son to you like Abraham did? I'd rather bring pieces for you to go between? Yeah, of course not. No, he was operating within no. the context of what he was commanded from God. Thank you. Yes. So when King David was given the covenant of the throne and he was said, you're always having the son sit on a throne, would it have been better for him to say, no, Lord, I'd rather climb Mount Sinai so you can give me two <laughs> tablets? 
Right, of course not. Yeah, he's operating okay. with. What are co thank you? What are covenants? Yeah, covenants are basically contractual agreements between two different parties regarding what you know. I, I, in these, in this context, is between God and Israel that certain stipulations will be followed and promises will be kept. Mm -hmm. So you do agree that the patriarchs and those that went before us had to operate in those covenant contracts that were governing their time period? Absolutely. So why would you think if a covenant was enacted with the blood of Messiah that we shouldn't have to operate in that covenant today? I don't believe that the covenant of the bloodshed of the Messiah has happened or that it is even okay. necessarily relevant because I don't believe that the Messiah has come. Is there any explicit prophecy of the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible that names the Messiah coming? So the word Mashiach is never used in the Tanakh. Is there, I'll rephrase then. Is there any prophecy in the Hebrew Bible that says Mashiach will do X, Y, Z? So as I understand it in my opening statement, I mentioned Hosea chapter 3, verse, verse 5. It's really, it's really like a yes or no, brother. Is there any passage that says Mashiach will do X, Y, Z in the Hebrew well, like Bible? Like I said, Mashiach is not used in the Tanakh to refer to the individual. That word is never used in the Tanakh. To my understanding, it is never used specifically to refer exclusively to the individual who we would both describe as Mashiach ben David. But that wasn't my question. I'm saying, is there any passage in the Hebrew Bible that says Mashiach will do X, Y, Z? Isaiah 11 is pretty explicit about... No, it doesn't have the word Mashiach will do X, Y, Z. Right, the only well, place exactly. Yeah, I just the, told you that, is that the word yeah. Mashiach is never used to exclusively refer to the Messiah, son of David who we would both understand in such a way. That's, that's Does Daniel 9, 24 to 27 says Mashiach will be cut off in a certain time period by a certain once time again, and that he will make an expiation for sin? Once, Yes, it does. Once again, the word Mashiach is never used in the Tanakh to exclusively refer to the Messiah, son of David. This would be the only exception if that's what you're going to assume. Are you a rabbinic Jew? Yes. Do you believe the sages teach the truth of the Hebrew Bible so that you can see the Messiah clearly? Yes. Okay. Exodus 23, 2 states, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. What does this mean? In 10 seconds, what does this mean? It means don't follow the majority to do evil. Who was Rambam? Rambam was a rabbinic scholar who compiled uh, books such as the Mishnah Torah, the, okay. He was. He was. Do you, a, know, that, do you yeah. know when Rambam reads Exodus twenty three two, he says to follow the majority and literally changes the words of Exodus twenty three two. Yeah, I'm aware. Okay, so you, but you said you use the you believe the sages teach the truth of the Hebrew Bible so that you can see the Messiah clearly. I do. But you thought you believe that another Rambam who reads the text is telling you the opposite of what the passage says clearly. I you believe think he's that, teaching you the truth. Yeah. So I believe that the. Sages of the, you know, the, the Chazal, whatever you want to call it, you know, like the, the, the rabbis, at the very mm -hmm. least, provide a clearer picture of truth than the New Testament authors. I so that's not the question I asked you. I said, do you believe that Rambam is teaching the truth of what the Hebrew Bible says? Because the, the Tanakh says one thing, Rambam changes it. You believe he's still teaching the truth? Well, you asked with regards to the Messiah, even the Rambam. No, no, this is what I'm asking. I'm asking you about this passage. Do, yeah, do, yeah, do you, yeah, I, I he believe. teaches truth. Even though he's changing the words of God, he's teaching the truth. You would say yes? I would say that over – look, if you have a, co a problem with Rambam's interpretation here – No, no, no. Is he teaching the truth or is he, the truth or is he not? Rambam, I don't believe that every single – that okay. every single thing the Rambam right. says is – No problem. No problem. No problem. Is Rambam authoritative in Judaism or not? He's relatively authoritative, I would say. All right, let's go forward. Deuteronomy 25, 11, and 12 states that if two men are fighting and the wife of one come near to deliver her husband and she grabs the genitals, that you should cut her hands off. You would say that would mean to cut her hand off, right? So according to the shot, it looks like that's what it would be. Okay. Do you know Rambam says that any person who teaches contrary to the Peshat is a false prophet and he should be strangled? Because the proper interpretation is that you should find her, and instead of finding her, if anyone who teaches that you actually cut off her hand, he should be stoned, he should be strangled because he's a false prophet. Do you think Rambam is teaching the truth of the passage or not?
do I? I mean, I'd have to look more into it to make an assessment because no, I, I'm telling you, it plainly says cut her hand off. Rambam says if you teach it means to cut her hands off, you're a false prophet. You should be strangled. Do you agree with Rambam or not? Like I said, I'd have to study more in depth to make a okay. Final decision. But you would agree that Rambam is not teaching the plain meaning of the passage. Yeah, he's looking at it from a more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the opposite perspective. Di a different perspective. He's looking at it from cutting a the hand off and fine. Is cutting the hand off a simple version, and the higher version is actually finding her? You would say that they're different. I would have or to would look say the same. I would have to okay, understand cool. his cheetah on how he came to that conclusion. No problem. No problem. Just going okay. forward, is it safe to say that there might be other rabbinic interpretations that have clouded the plain meaning of the passage? There's plenty of different rabbinic interpretations on. The, it's very difficult. That have changed the plain meaning of the passage. On some level, depending on what. Okay. Do you? Okay. My next question: Would you? Would you then agree that it's possible that some of the rabbis who you follow's reading of the Hebrew Bible have clouded your understanding of the rabbinic of the biblical passages so much so that you can't even recognize the timeline of the coming of the Messiah to recognize that we are indeed in the new covenant? No, because the rabbis recognize that every generation there's some potential for the Messiah to come. If so my point is, my point is, is that the rabbis are specifically in two places clouding the plain meaning of the passage. And you yourself said, rewind the tape, that you use the sages to help you understand what the Tanakh says. But if the sages are clouding the plain meaning of the passage, is it possible that you cannot recognize what the Messiah should be doing? Therefore, you can't recognize that we're in the new covenant. I would say relative to the New Testament, no, because I believe that. The no, no, no. This isn't about the New Testament. This is. A, I asked you a question, brother. This is my understanding. Do you think it's possible? Do you think, last question, do you think it's possible that the rabbis have clouded the plain meaning of the passage so much so that you can't even recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah and fulfilled the plain prophecies and that we are indeed in the governing new covenant? No, because when you look at the actual meaning of the text, very clearly i don't have to i didn't use rabbis for example anywhere in my what i, was I didn't say you did use rabbis i'm saying you do use rabbis because the way that you're using rabbis is in the timeline because you can't push shot level find the timeline of the coming of the messiah the way you represented it the reason why i time. use rabbis is because i made a comparison between what what the uh new testament says versus what the rabbis say and I found the rabbis to be more consistent with the Tanakh. That's my official reason why I follow rabbis. All right. Thank you so much. That was that was fun. This is why this is my favorite part of the discussion. I would rather have, honestly, an hour stream of cross-examination of just discussion like that. Because that's just, I, I love the interaction, man. I, I really do. So, Yehuda, it is now your turn. You have 10 minutes before you start, though, I'm going to say again, addressing the people, if you're enjoying this dialogue, if you're enjoying this conversation, please subscribe to Radar Apologetics, subscribe to Yehuda Yisrael, subscribe to God Logic Apologetics, yours truly by the grace of God, and uh, make sure you hit that like button if you haven't already. We have almost 300 people in here watching. Let's get these likes up to match the viewership and go beyond even the viewership, okay? God bless you guys. All right, Yehuda, 10 minutes whenever you start speaking. All right. Radar, do you believe that the only way for us to receive forgiveness and atonement for our sins today is through the shedding of Jesus or Yeshua's blood and or his death on the cross? I believe the way that we receive forgiveness of sins in 2023 is by operating in the governing covenant. Is that through Jesus's death on the cross? The blood, that covenant was inaugurated with the shed blood of the Messiah. Yes. Okay. Can you provide an explicit explicit statement in the Tanakh where God prescribes the shedding of Jesus's blood and or his death on the cross as the only way for us yeah. to receive forgiveness and atonement that, for us today. That was that wasn't my statement. Just like in our cross exam and I asked you if we can retro so I asked you a ourselves. question. Can you provide an explicit statement? It's yes or no. I can. I can. There are explicit statements that state that you must operate in the covenant just there like Leviticus 26. Jesus blood Levit is the only way <laughs> to atone for sin. Sure. Leviticus 26, Leviticus 26. I did that is not see you're forcing the question on me. And what I'm, I'm asking not saying the is, question. This is my QA. You have to answer. Yes, it or is no. your question. Is there an so say it again? Say it again. Topic. Say it again. Because I want to I want to be I want to be sure. Yes or no. Is I want to be sure that I'm hearing you care. I, I want to be sure Tanakh. that I'm hearing you carefully. Can you just repeat the question real quick? Yes. Can you provide an explicit statement in the Tanakh where God prescribes the shedding of Jesus's blood and or Jesus's death on the cross? 
as the only way for us to receive forgiveness and atonement for our sins today. Simple. Well, yes. I think things like the, well, things like that are not explicitly stated in exactly. the Hebrew Thank Bible. So, so hold on for a second. Let him let him let him give his response. Yehuda, you gotta let him give his response. He answered no. That's the answer. Well, yeah. He, so he no, but hold on. Out. But it is it isn't that simple because we only have one passage of when the Messiah will do X Y Z. And I think it's funny but that we'll you're willing to, to push off we'll the that. prophecy I when I, I think it's funny that you push off the prophecy where it says Mashiach will do X Y Z and you push I, that off and you don't care about that answer. and you push Moderator. it. Why are you yelling, brother? Why you asked for? All right, I'm pausing your time. I'm pausing your time, Yehuda. I paused your time because look, look, because I don't want your time wasted. I want you to be able to fully get out your questions, but. If you're asking a question, you got to let the man answer as well. Like he it's not just a no. It ended up, oh, he all right, you can cut him off right there. Like he, he let you flush out your answers, too. Sure. There are some there are some that were just yes. Yes or no. Like, is there a verse? Yes or no. No. Or yes. The answer and he no. gives his response. Yes, right. Won. So. So can we agree let, that Hosea chapter three, verse four? On, just, just, I got to answer know, your previous question, just, though. Just, wait, hold on. Just just you let me you know. No, about, that is your answer. Yehuda, Yehuda. Statement. I'm about to I'm about to start your time again, so you have you have eight minutes left or seven fifty eight left. Okay, um, go ahead. All right. So you asked the question about explicit statements about Jesus. We don't have any explicit statements even about the Messiah. So to look at that is even the false premise. What we do have is the model of the Hebrew Bible that God interacts with His people in covenants, in governing covenants. He laid prophecies to unravel covenants. Every covenant, you yourself admitted, it would be ridiculous for people to go back into the covenant previously. They had to operate. You yourself said that they had to operate in the covenant of their time. So if Yeshua is the Messiah, if he fulfilled the prophecies, which can clearly be demonstrated, he fulfilled the timeline of the coming of the Messiah, then indeed he is the Messiah. It's it's not it's not a problem. It's not an issue. God operates in covenants, not just shed bloodness. The shed bloodness is what brings us into the covenant. It's not the actual sacrifices. All right. Since we're wasting time, do you understand Daniel 926 regarding the end of transgression sin of, of sin to refer to the shedding of Jesus's blood and death on the cross? I think it specifically says that the Messiah will be cut off and that this work of the Messiah is what brings the expiation of sin that will be dealt with in Daniel 924 to 27, which is the only prophecy of what we see a Messiah doing. Do you understand Daniel 924 to refer to the initiation of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31? I see Daniel 9, 24 to 27 as being the initiation of the new covenant within the timeline of what the new covenant is supposed to do at the time period that's supposed to be unraveled. It's not an issue. Other than your position on the chronology of the new covenant needing to be initiated before the destruction of the second temple in Daniel 9, can you show me anywhere else in the Tanakh where the new covenant is indicated to be initiated before the destruction of the second temple? I don't think, I think one prophecy is good enough to show that. Okay. Can we agree that sin still exists in the world today and that belief in Jesus does not prevent a person from sinning today? Say that again. I'm sorry. Can we agree that sin still exists in the world today and that belief in Jesus does not prevent a person from sinning today? Belief in Jesus does not, but you're presupposing the wrong timeline. Do you believe based upon the interpretation Mashiach, of the rabbis? Do you believe that the word Mashiach, this this Mashiach who is cut off in Daniel? Uh, 926 refers to the death and the shedding of the blood of Jesus on the cross. I do. Can you show me anywhere else in the Tanakh other than your interpretation of Daniel 9, where the Hebrew word Mashiach is used to refer exclusively to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else? Can I say it again? I'm sorry, man. Can you say show me anywhere else in the Tanakh other than your interpretation of Daniel 9, where the Hebrew word Mashiach is used to exclusively refer to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. Yehuda, you presuppose the wrong ideas, brother. Your exegesis is way Pretty off. Ironic, that, that's buddy. my answer. I'm going to answer you. I'm going to answer you. I'm going to answer you. So the first time we hear the word Mashiach ever is based upon what the priest does. Okay. Zechariah also, it talks about that the one that the one who sits in front of you, the, the branch who's going to come, which is unequivocally the Messiah, that the priests are going to be a sign of it. What does the priest do? Does he come and sit on a throne? No, the priest serves, he mediates, he gives himself, he works for the people his whole life. This is what the model we have with the Levitical priesthood. Why are you expecting to see these things so black and white and plain? Sound the alarm, the Messiah is going to do X, Y, Z. The only time is in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which you have not given a proper exegesis and of. The timeline is coming. How can it be? is a generic word in the Tanakh that refers to being anointed, which can refer to the anointing of generic prophets, objects, high priests, 
even Gentile kings like it King is, Cyrus, and is not no. a specific identifier unique to the Messiah, son of David, in the Tanakh. Because when you see the word Mashiach, me anywhere else in the Tanakh, where when the you word see Mashiach in that way, show me when one you see other. Mashiach, I'm, I'm I'm trying to. When you see Mashiach, when you see Mashiach, Yehuda, when you see Mashiach, and you see that word there. Okay, and it says that the anointed priest, Kohen Mashiach, when you see him sitting there, this is generic. This is saying there's a generic priestly Messiah who's going to do these things, X, Y, Z, that there's one who's going to do this. This is an anointed priest. Clearly, we know it's generic. This is context, brother. This is exegesis 101. This is a simple approach to the text. But when it says the Messiah will come, the Messiah is coming. This one who will be right. cut off. This one who will bring expiation of sin. He is the one who is to come. The context of the passage tells us that it is one that is unique and different. The same thing with Isaiah 53. The same thing in the passage. The context tells us that it's focusing on one individual who will give himself, who will I die, and who will see his offspring. Questions, and you're going on and on. So I want to be able to. You ask, ask me a question, I'm answering, brother. Please, How man. We, you ask me a question, I'm answering agree? it, man. I'm can trying to. I'm, Stop. Can we agree? I'm trying to keep it coolly with you. I'm trying to keep it coolly with you. You're yelling, brother. Calm let's, down. Let's, 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 let him ask, let's let him ask this verse question. Verse 4 states that Israel will have an experience, uh, will experience an exile for many years where we will not have a king or a sacrifice. I don't know what your question is. I'm sorry to we hear. We agree that Hosea chapter 3, verse 4 states that Israel will experience an exile for many years where we will not have a king or a sacrifice. Um, yeah. Do you believe that we are living in this state of exile today? Yeah. We both agree that Hosea chapter 3, verse 5 says that David, their king, that this refers to the future messianic king who will rule at the end of days, as the verse explicitly states. I think this, the David, the king who is to come, you mm -hmm. know, who is, is the Messiah who would exactly. come. And he came in the first century the way Daniel 9, 24 to 27 came. Even though it says, can we agree that Hosea chapter 3, verse 5 gives us no indication that David, their king, a.k.a. the son of Messiah, son of David, must come before the final exile that we find ourselves in today? Oh, oh uh, Yehuda, there's more than one verse in the Bible. So yeah. we need to let them communicate with each other is what I'm saying. I'm talking about this so, verse specifically. These verses. Every verse is not exhaustive about every single thing. You have to line the passages I up. Agree. Does this I verse agree. I agree. You have to we agree that Hosea chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, gives us a clear formula of how we are supposed to return to God. And that this includes using our words to supplicate God for our forgiveness of our sins. Here's my answer. Hosea is not more authoritative than the book of Leviticus, which says that forgiveness is found rooted in the governing covenant of that time. The covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that shed blood. And now we are in the governing covenant of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. Can we agree that Abraham, that Abraham with the covenant between the pieces had nothing to do with Abraham using the blood of Jesus to make that covenant? I think that's a crazy claim to say it has nothing to do with it. If their covenant is building upon each other, then they have to do they have to deal with one another. God isn't popping in the middle of history, coming up with doing different things. Can we agree that the faith of Abraham was not described as being the faith of believing that Jesus died of his sin, died for his sins? When we I don't know if I, Genesis. I don't know if I could agree with that. I, I mean, Jesus himself says Abraham longed to see my day. Show me in the scripture where Abraham believed. God, that Jesus died for his sins. Well, I think it's very interesting that in Genesis, where Abraham is told about the seed and about the land, when Rashi, Abraham goes and offers a sacrifice because of his thankfulness to God, I think it's interesting that when Rashi talks about that scenario, that he says that Abraham did this because of the gospel of the seed and of the land. Yes, and none of that had to do with Jesus dying for his sins. Right, look, so I'm not saying it has to or that, not. I'm just saying it's interesting that, that Rashi is using that language, and I think it's paired with the hope that Abraham had, which of the seed that will recognize, reconcile the fall in the garden. And I'm sure your five minutes have been over a long time ago. You got 20 seconds left. Can we agree that in contrast to Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, which we previously agreed identifies the Messiah as David their king, who will rule at the end of days, Daniel 9.26 gives no explicit indication that this Mashiach who was cut off must have been of the house of David. I have no idea what your question means. I'm sorry. Well, that's... Well, that's I, I think I deserve an answer for asking it. 
Can I can't answer a question that you didn't articulate clearly for me to understand. We agree that in that, contrast, that, Jose, that, we that both is, agree. That is time. That is time, guys. Uh, but will he be able to answer my question though? Oh, maybe maybe somebody can bring it up in the Q and A. The, well, the, the please, time is up. This is important time because is up. I think I think he uh, was not uh, just because he doesn't understand a question. I think it's important that he is able to. Get I'm willing there. to take 10 seconds and try to answer it if he wants okay, to ask so it. And Avery okay with it. If, Avery, if Avery's okay with it, if Avery's okay with that, yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine. That Hosea chapter 3, verse 5, when it says David their king, that that refers exclusively to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Exactly. Who will rule at the end of days. Now, Daniel 9 26, right? It doesn't mention David anywhere, right? It gave no uh -huh. explicit indication that this Mashiach, right, who we agree is a generic word that is not exclusive to the Messiah anywhere else in the Tanakh, right? Yet, you claim it refers to the Messiah, son of David, yet you can't provide any other scripture that would say that Mashiach, the Hebrew word Mashiach, refers exclusively to the Messiah, son of David. Yet we can agree that David, their king, is exclusive to the Mashiach, son of David. Why are we able to agree there, but here, we can't agree. Is this a question or a monologue? No, I'm asking you, why do you think, you asked me, your first question to me was, why do you, th do you think it would be okay if Noah uh, asked this question hypothetically about sacrificing animals? I'm asking you, why do you think we are able to agree that David, their king, who will rule at the end of days in Hosea chapter three, verse five, is exclusive to the Messiah, yet... We can't agree that this Mashiach mentioned in uh, Daniel 9, 26 refers exclusively to the Messiah, son of David. Why right, Yehuda, I'll say it like this. All of the passages speak to the Messiah. There is one Mashiach, not multiple Messiahs coming. There is one seed of a woman, as it says in Genesis, is one singular seed who will reconcile the fall in the garden. This is inaugurated by the new covenant, period, point blank, and that is my answer. Thank you. All right. So, all right, cool. We got that out the way. So now we're going into the next section, which is our five minute rebuttals. Again, I wish that you guys no, probably close, could... close, close, close. Oh, yeah, yeah. Five minute closing, five minute closing. Um, I, I wish that you guys would have had another cross examining se se uh, section on there, but I don't know why you guys are being boring. Anyway, <laughs> we could do another one. <laughs> Another one next time. We'll uh, we'll schedule. No, I have topic. really more questions to ask. If you want to, for sure. You, 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 it, I nah, nah. I can't today. I can't. I can't you, do you another. You have you have to come back, bro. You have to come back and do this again. So we would like part two or something. Like we got to continue this. Yeah, for these sure. cross examinations were not long enough. That was partly what was frustrating about this. I have like a whole slew of questions that I wanted to get to, and I that you can only do in a short short amount of time. That's what I'm talking about. Like this, this the cross examination should be the longest part of the debate, in my opinion. Right. So like. Oh, open the statements and then straight to back and forth in my opinion but okay all right so um hit that like button guys uh we have almost 400 people in here god bless each and every one of you if you forgot to do it please do it right now hit that like button it really helps with the algorithm if you're enjoying the conversation enjoying the debate uh god bless you guys for tuning in and coming in uh so uh radar apologetics five minutes for your closing statement Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for being a part of this. Um, you know, he's repeated uh, multiple ways to be forgiven, but that's not the issue if we have multiple ways forgiven. I mean, what we've seen clearly is a poor display of exegesis, trying to harp on one verse and one passage. It is the fullness of the passages that are interpreted together that give us the meaning of what the Bible says Clearly, what I brought in my opening statement, which in the close, just as a reminder, we're not to bring in new information, so I won't do that. But in the opening statement, what I said was, is that there was a fall in the garden that had to be reconciled. During the cross-examination, um, Yehuda was very clear that he, we cannot go back into prior covenants. It is undeniable, according to the evidence of the Hebrew Bible, that we are indeed in the new covenant, in the time period of the governing new covenant. We are not under the old covenants that have predated, but the new covenant does build on top of it. Just like in the cross examine section, Yehuda was very clear. He added that back, back. We cannot go back. We can go back. Clearly, it would be ridiculous to think that Abraham could interact with God the way Noah did. 
clearly it would be ridiculous to think that Moses could interact with God the way that Abraham did. So clearly it's ridiculous to think that you're going to operate in the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law, when we are in the new covenant reality. This is why my friend um, Yehuda has missed the whole entire point of this debate. The reason I will echo again why Yehuda cannot see the plain meaning of the passages and gets very frustrated when we're talking about these things is because he has put on the lens of rabbinic Judaism, which I believe completely paralyzes a person from being able to see the plainness of the meaning of the word of God. As I demonstrated by Rambam's usage of two different passages, he perverts the plain meaning of the passage and thereby cripples the Jewish people from being able to see plainly that Yeshua is the Messiah. Does Rambam do this intentionally? No, he does not. Well, my friend Yehuda, my opponent, um, who I do respect and thank for doing this, but he is on the wrong side of the fence. He has been so contaminated by the understanding of traditional Judaism that he is even believing that immediately when the Messiah comes, that there should be peace, that everyone should know God. He can't see the plainness of the passages that correlate with Zechariah 9 and Daniel 7. I get the frustration. It's very hard to break away from the way that we were brought up and to see what the passages plainly say. But my prayer is that by the Spirit, of the living God, that Yehuda will come to repentance and be able to see plainly what the passage says and to come to the Messiah that our fathers did indeed look forward to. I will echo Leviticus 26. He did use this passage as the model of return. He himself said, this is the model of return. But go back, watch the debate, listen to his opening statement, listen to his rebuttal. He did not quote the end. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham as well. And I will remember the land. Why did God have to remember that? Because they had to operate in the blood of the covenant and the blood that inaugurated that covenant. We indeed are in the timeline of the Messiah. As I shared, as I echo, and I will shout from the rooftops, Daniel 9 is the only passage where it says explicitly, the Messiah will do this. He will expiate for sin. He will be cut off. What is the need for Daniel to receive such an immense revelation? If we're just talking about a random generic gas station messiah that everybody can have in every generation and this is the one this is the messiah he died for me he died for you profess him believe in him repent embrace the gospel be born again receive the holy spirit and be whole this is the purpose this is the thing i'm not here to be right i'm not here to win debates i'm here to share the gospel of the king of kings lord of lords the triune god and what we see is in the scripture my hope is that every person under the sound of my voice will remove any blinders from approaching the word of God and they will see it plainly for what it is. Let's look at this passage. Let's look at the text and let's see what it plainly says. Don't listen to rabbis. Don't listen to traditions. Don't listen to anything that's going to contaminate the plainness of the word of God as my opponent has done. He cannot with his reiteration and repeating of verses with all due respect, see plainly what they mean. There is a there is a conflicting Zechariah 9 coming on a donkey and Daniel 7 coming with the clouds. The rabbis teach that this is one or the other because they can't make sense of it because they are rejecting Yeshua the Messiah. This is a falsehood. This is this is not true. It is indeed two comings of the Messiah, the same way Moses came and was rejected, the same way Joseph was sold by his brothers, rejected, then he revealed himself. It's the model of the Hebrew Bible, brothers and sisters. Don't make Yehuda's mistake. Don't hang your hat on one verse. Let the verses interact with one another, and this is how you do proper exegesis. May the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, may the triune God be blessed and praised for this stream. And with that, that's my time. Amen, amen. All right. Thank you so much. Yehuda, whenever you're ready, brother. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank Radar and God Logic again for hosting this very important debate topic. I want to encourage Jews and Christians to have these sorts of focused dialogues surrounding this topic specifically. I truly believe that any New Testament believers who listen to this debate sincerely and review it and study the sources will have to conclude that the death of Jesus or Yeshua on the cross is not necessary for the forgiveness of atonement, and salvation of mankind. I want to highlight my opponent's inconsistency in identifying prophecies that are exclusive to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. This is a common mistake that New Testament believers make regarding vague prophecies like the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and the vague reference to Mashiach mentioned in Daniel 9.26. None of these prophecies give us any indication that they are exclusive to the Messiah, son of David, or that the Messiah, son of David, must come before the destruction of the second temple. Rather, Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 indicates that David, their king, who my opponent agreed, refers exclusively to the Messiah, son of David, 
and no one else will rule at the end of days and does not need to come before the destruction of the second temple. New Testament believers have no choice but to agree. And yes, this is validated by rabbinic literature too. I did my homework. I'd also like to encourage my fellow rabbinic Jews and Noahides to study this debate to learn how to demonstrate how to dismantle the flawed theology of the New Testament by literally going for the jugular and demonstrating to the New Testament believer that Jesus' bloodshed and death on the cross is not necessary for our forgiveness of our sins today. Therefore, there is no reason to believe that Jesus or Yeshua is a prophet, the Messiah, or God. This argument takes care of all those erroneous ideas at once by destroying the core theological claim regarding Jesus or Yeshua in the New Testament. I've even used these same arguments against Dr. Michael Brown on my YouTube channel, and it effectively dismantles his theology. So this method is tried and true. Every New Testament believer of all denominations has no choice but to affirm this flawed theology, because if it isn't true, Jesus died in vain. Let's be completely honest with ourselves. Jesus' bloodshed and death on the cross did not get rid of the sins of mankind, as sin still exists in the world today. This is understandably a scary thought for a believer in Jesus because they are under the erroneous impression that true forgiveness and atonement is impossible without Jesus' bloodshed and death on the cross. That's why countless Christians have come to me sincerely asking, what are we supposed to do about sin today if we don't have a temple to do sacrifices to make atonement? Well, don't despair. For God so loved the world that he provided a formula for mankind to receive forgiveness and atonement for sin before Jesus was even a twinkle in his mother's eye. It is through our sincere confession of our sins, contrition of our hearts, and our actions of true repentance through our observance of Torah that we are able to successfully receive forgiveness of our sins, even during times of exile without a temple today. Rabbinic Jews have been following the example of Daniel and have been praying three times a day for over 2,000 years, just as Daniel did in the face of death during the Babylonian exile. And just as the Jews were able to go back to Israel and build the temple after the Babylonian exile, we also hope to do the same after this uh, exile, as God promises us in the Tanakh regarding the future Messianic era. When the true new covenant of Jeremiah comes to fruition, we won't be having this debate anymore. If Jesus's bloodshed and death on the cross was the fulfillment of this new covenant spoken of by Jeremiah, then you wouldn't have two Jews in a debate right now trying to teach each other to know the Lord. This very debate proves that Jesus's death on the cross was not the fulfillment of the new covenant of Jeremiah chapter 31. Instead, we follow God's commands for us to return to him through our sincere prayers and repentance and observance of the commands of the Torah so that we may experience the promised future third temple and reinstate the Levitical system once again so that the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and in former years. Contrast with Hebrews 10.4, which states that the sacrifices never even atoned for anything. Guess they never read Leviticus 17.11. As Malachi, so going back to this, it says, and it will only be after the final exile that God himself will circumcise our hearts and the hearts of our offspring, as Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 6 explains. This will be the future new covenant that Jesus or Yeshua failed to fulfill, but will be fulfilled when the true Messiah comes at the end of days, just as Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 promises. Once again, I'd like to conclude with Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, to highlight our messianic hope for the future third temple. I will bring them to my holy mount, and I will cause them to rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. May it happen speedily in our days. Shalom and thank you. Uh... I don't know. You're muted, bro. Yeah. You're muted, Sheikh. Yeah, I was just making sure that you guys are paying attention. Um, we in here, baby. All right, good, good, good. So we're going into the the uh, the Q and A section, um, and yeah. so there's going to be 15 minutes of that, which is beautiful. Thank you, Yehuda. Thank you, uh, Radar Apologetics, for the closing statements and you guys' participation. Guys, please send your questions. Um, hit the like button. If you're enjoying this conversation, please hit that like button. Um, I actually want to start with questions for both of you guys, and then we'll go to the guests in the uh, in the comment section. So I have a question for you, um, Rabbi Eduardo, hashtag real yeah. rabbi. Um, so so Yehuda brought up uh, the new covenant verse in Jeremiah, right? That talks mm -hmm. about the new covenant and how um, 
you know, once that when the new covenant comes, the the law will be on the heart of the believers. And, uh, you know, you won't have people wondering who God is, basically, and, and having to teach about who God is. And so if Jesus is the Messiah, how can you reconcile this? It doesn't look like this is fulfilled yet. Yeah, I think we're missing like I brought up throughout the debate, which it was clearly articulated, we're missing the Zechariah 9, Daniel 7 passages, the two comings, which is the imagery of the Messiah. Even rabbinic Judaism believes in a coming of Moses in the end of days that he will come back. We believe in a second coming of Elijah. Why should there not be two comings? I did a full video on quasi-redemptions where there are voices within rabbinic Judaism that believe in multiple comings. There is no timeline, though, which is given of when this is going to happen. It just talks about that this is part of what will be the new covenant in its fruition. Clearly, this is not the fullness. I think the, the biggest problem is to how do you reconcile with Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that we are in the time when the Messiah should have come and how he didn't. That's the bigger problem. So if that's explicit, and Jeremiah 31 is not explicit about the timeline, then who? what do we go with? Do we hang our hats on the not specific verse in Jeremiah 31, or do we hang our hats on the specific? Clearly, it, a good process of interpretation is we elevate our understanding to where Scripture's at. We don't make Scripture fit our plain understanding as we bring it down. We elevate ourselves, and that's how we reconcile the passages. We go from explicit. It must mean that the timeline is not immediate as we have inside the, the Torah and the Prophets. Yehuda, would you like to give a response to that or say something to the question? Yeah, absolutely. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 6, it talks about, in verse 6 specifically, that God will put the new covenant on our hearts, right? I'm sure radar apologetics would agree with me that this refers to the new covenant, right? When it says, God will put the covenant on your heart. In Deuteronomy mm -hmm. chapter 30, verse 6, we agree, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look at the chronology of this, it doesn't say it's happening before the destruction of the second temple. We can even read it out loud right now. It's to summarize it. It says that it's after the exiles are ingathered. Right. That's why I asked Radar in the debate to show me anywhere else other than Daniel nine. And he kind of laughed at it and said, oh, I only need one reference. The problem is, is that what I sound like? Is that what I sound like? Yeah. Don't do that, bro. That's what you, said. you don't want people. Well, that's bro. What you you don't want people making fun of people's voices, bro. So don't do it, bro. Don't do it. Don't do it, bro. What you don't said. do it. Don't mock me. Don't mock me. So if you go Respect, bro. to uh, Ezekiel chapter thirty-six, right, where it talks about the covenant, the new covenant, right, says a new covenant of your heart. It echoes exactly why you agree, right, are that the new covenant of the heart. In Ezekiel 30. Just answer the question, dog. Just answer the question. Don't well, bring me to the answer your question. Do, do we no, this, this isn't no, you know, just, just, just to be clear, this isn't like uh okay, it's to not, go back and forth with you guys. So let's assume that radar apologetics, like 99% of all Christians, probably hundred percent, agree that the new covenant is no brother, same, brother, just to covenant. just to respond to what radar yeah. like said about, about uh, Jeremiah. Yeah, this is what I'm responding to. Okay. This is the same covenant of Jeremiah, the new heart. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the same covenant. This is Ezekiel 36. It's okay. the same new covenant as the covenant of Deuteronomy 30, verse six, and the same new covenant of Ezekiel 36 that says the new heart, replacing the heart of stone with the new heart. Right. We're all we're all on the same page. These are all the same covenant. OK, so okay. what's happening is if you look at the context of Ezekiel 36 and Deuteronomy 30, both of those passages say that the new heart and God will put the covenant on our hearts chronologically after the ingathering of the exiles, the final redemption, not before the destruction of the second temple. That's why I was forcing Radar's hand and saying, show me another passage because I can show you collaborating evidence that the new covenant of Jeremiah, where, where all of us will know God and we won't have to teach each other to know the Lord, will happen after the final ingathering of the exiles. That, does that make sense? Got you. Yeah, I got your point. Thank you so much. Now, a question for you, and then um, I'll let uh, the chats come in. So uh, Daniel Daniel 9 speaks of uh, the, the, the time frame in which the Messiah will come. Uh, do you understand that the Messiah would come in the first century? I mean, I'm sorry, in the, uh, yeah, in the, uh, you know, in between, before the destruction of the temple. You're asking me or him? You. No, I don't understand that the Messiah needed to come before the destruction. of. So the how, how do you how do you uh, break down the timeline of uh, Daniel nine when it talks about the Messiah coming? So I don't have a problem with once again, the fundamental question 
is it's not talking about the Messiah, right? I made a point to say the Hebrew word Mashiach is never used in the Tanakh, except if you're going to make an exception for Daniel 9, 26, right? Where it refers exclusively to what me and Radar would refer to as the Messiah, son of David. That's why I asked him, why can we agree about Hosea 3, 5, David, their king at the end of days, referring to only the Messiah, yet here with this word Mashiach in Daniel 9, 26, we can't agree because there's not a specific, it's not a specific word to the Messiah in the Tanakh. That's the misconception that a lot of people have because colloquially the word Mashiach is used to refer to the Messiah, son of David in Christian and Jewish circles. But in the Tanakh, ironically, and a lot of people don't know this, there is not one instance aside from my, you know, the Christian interpretation of Daniel 9, 26, where the Hebrew word Mashiach would refer to the Messiah, son of David, and only the Messiah, son of David. And I would challenge Jews and Christians to find me an exception to this, including Radar. Right. And he couldn't. Thank you. All right. So Radar, would you like a res response to that? Yeah, brother. I think the passages have to reconcile one with another. It's plainly evident that it's 70 years of sin uh, that the people did, 70 Shemitah years, 70 years of Sabbaths that they didn't keep, which equals to 70 weeks of years, which is 490 years that the Jewish people did not keep the Sabbath. And therefore, they were given seven years in exile as prophesied by Jeremiah. Daniel in his 70th year um, knows that they're coming up to the end of the exile. So what does he do? He reaches out to God and receives an answer that another 490 years are decreed for your people. The first set leads up to the rebuilding of the temple from the time of the decree. Temple gets rebuilt later on. And then we have another set of years that takes us to the first century. That's 483 years. There are seven years that are cut off, which are the tribulation period that we find inside of the book of Revelation. So the timeline's clear. This isn't a messianic convention. This is actually... Um, something that we find within Judaism and Jewish sources like Rashi himself says that in the first century uh, would have been the timeline that Daniel was talking about. It isn't just because we see the word Mashiach that we think it's the Messiah. Vessels get anointed. Pots get anointed. When it says that this is anointed pot, I don't think he's the Messiah that's going to come and die for my sins. This pot, that's ridiculous. The context tells us that there is one individual who is going to come and, and expiate sin based upon Genesis 3 and the original fall in the garden. He's the one to deal with sin, and it was prophesied by God himself when he cursed the serpent. Thank you. All right, so we have something from Scott A. Thank you, Scott, big brother. He says, the Targum says uh, for Isaiah 59, 16, says the word of the Lord will intercede for us because no man could. Does he believe that? It's uh, I don't know how to say that, uh, Rabbi Eduardo Mag McGillah 3a. So, yeah. page of Talmud. All right, so do, do you believe, uh, he's asking you, uh, Yehuda, do you believe this? That the according to the Targum, um, it says that the word of the Lord will intercede, uh, for you because no man could. Do you, do you believe that, uh, in the Targums? I mean, the word of the law, the Lord, as you know, I could be wrong, but as I understand it, doesn't refer to a man. Right. It's not referring. To, it says the word of the Lord. It doesn't say it refers to a man. So I don't have a problem with that. All right. Would you like to give a say something about uh, it? Uh, yeah, I can't respond to Yehuda's answer because I don't know what his what his point, what his answer was. And the point yeah, was that. So I, I'm not able to respond to that. But I can give my perspective. Mm -hmm. The Targums are ancient Jewish um, paraphrases and translations of the Hebrew Bible into the language so that people can understand just so people know what Targums are. And they were very much interpretive and in, sometimes in the ways that the Septuagint is, it, it solidifies and freezes the meaning of that school of Jews and what they thought about the passage. Many times we see that the God himself, yod heh who is high and lifted up and distant from his creation, he does interact with his creation. How does he do this? Is through his word. So we understand this to be um, his memra, which is also the logos theology of John chapter one. It's also called the Devar in Hebrew. So what the point of this whole passage and the point of the Targums and why they're so important is that the Memra, the word of God, is God himself yet distinct from God, showing a complex unity of God. Indeed, it was the Memra of God, the word of God that, that Abraham saw walking in the garden. This is plain meaning, the cold Adonai, they heard the voice of God. So he is God, he's yod heh vav -Heh, but distinct from him. The Memra is the angel of the Lord. That is what the passage talks about. And this is where the Targums present it um so yeah so not an issue not a problem for me man i say amen big shout out to the targums 
Amen, amen. All right, question for Yehuda. Uh, we got five minutes left, guys. So if we can keep the answers like within, try to 45 seconds to a minute, we can, guys. Okay, so I'm going to get to other questions. Uh, for Yehuda, when the third temple is built and they do not, and they do the first sacrifice, what will happen when the presence of Hashem does not come? Well, we're, the uh, idea is that it says in the Tanakh that God will be validating the third temple. I read it over and over again in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, where it says that all the nations will come. So that's just not going to be a thing. It says that this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, I showed in Malachi chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, I didn't get a chance to ask Radar because we ran out of time, but it's talking about a prophecy that the Levitical priests will offer sacrifices up in righteousness, just like the days of old, which proves that in the past, uh, contrary to Hebrews 10, 4, that says it's impossible for the blood of animals to take away sins. Literally, it says in Isaiah 56, verse seven, that we're going to be doing it, the sacrifices again with animals, not with Jesus blood, and that they will be pleasing to the Lord. And it's, but once again, validated Malachi chapter three, which I understand to be about the future third temple. Jesus okay. didn't fulfill any of this. So that's simply a messianic prophecy that Jesus didn't fulfill. All right. Would you like to say something about that really quick, Rabbi? No, no. All right. Next question for both. What do you think of uh, the Targums, Yeshu, Yerushalayim, Jonathan? Yerush Yerushalayim, Jonathan, Nelfiti. Thank you. Saying that the king uh, Mashiach, Mashiach Messiah in Aramaic, will bring the cure for the serpent's poison for the sins of Eve's children in Genesis 3. Go ahead, first rabbi. Amen. All right. And uh, <laughs> what about you, Yehuda? What do you think about uh, this in the Targums? Yeah, so once again, even when we look in the Targums for Isaiah 53, for example, in Isaiah 50, well, said Isaiah 52, I think, verse 14, it mm -hmm. doesn't just mention the Messiah as being the servant, right? Because this is relating to the suffering servant. If you go to Isaiah 53, verse 10, where it talks about the, you know, prolonging of days, it doesn't just say it's the Messiah. It says their days will be prolonged and their countenance was marred. So, Christians will often look at rabbinic literature and say, oh, wow, this is about the Messiah. The rabbis missed this. No, they didn't. They're acknowledging that not only is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 about Israel, it's about the Messiah too, because the Messiah is a part of Israel, right? The shot actually says in Isaiah 49, 3, that the servant is Israel, who will be a light unto the nations. Read the verses. It's explicit. Now, I just showed how Ezekiel was able to suffer for the sins and bear the sins of Israel. So he is an example of someone apart from just the Messiah who is able to reconcile and atone for sins. And the rabbis concur with this in Sanhedrin uh, 39, it's, it's Sanhedrin 39 A or B. So if you're going to quote rabbinic literature and say that there's an idea of a suffering Messiah, amen. But if you're going to ignore the rabbinic literature that says that Israel is also a part of this suffering along with the Messiah, then you are misrepresenting rabbinic literature and you just aren't being honest. All right. Thank you. Uh, Martin has a question. He says, how do billions of Gentiles approach the God of Israel? Is it through the seven laws of Noah? If so. How will billions of people even hear or know of these laws? I guess that's the, either. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want if you could be quick, because we only have a minute. So just go to Zechariah chapter eight. If you go to Zechariah chapter eight and you start at verse 19, it says explicitly that these fasts that only rabbinic Jews that I know of have kept through the past 2000 years regarding the destruction of the temple will become festivals of joy when the future third temple is built. That's what is implied. And it says, so said the Lord of hosts, there will yet be a time that peoples and the inhabitants of many cities shall come and the inhabitants shall uh, go to one another and say, let us go and pray before the Lord to entreat the Lord of hosts. I will go too. And many peoples and powerful nations shall come and entreat the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to pray before the Lord. So said the Lord of hosts in those days when 10 men of all the languages of the nation shall take hold of the skirt of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That is the future hope 
for the Messiah that Jesus failed to fulfill and that will happen when we rebuild the temple and the Gentiles come to Jerusalem to learn about God from Jews. Thank you. Rabbi Eduardo, would you like to say something? All right. So I don't know why we're starting in the middle of the book of Zechariah, but that's that's funny. Um, so going back to Genesis, there's a seed who would come and he would rectify the fall in the garden. This covenant is reiterated to Abraham that he will be a father of many nations. Building upon that, they get the Mosaic law, the Davidic promise of a future one to sit upon the throne. This is Jesus of Nazareth, a lowly Jew, um, very poor, didn't have a place to lay his head but he didn't travel more than 200 miles of his home and billions upon billions of those in the world bow and profess him as Lord and Savior. So that's how billions of them approach God through that merit. The seven laws of Noah are basuda, they're trash, they're made up, they're fictional. You might as well go read a Dr. Seuss book, it's not real life. Um, they hear about these laws and these truths through Jesus and Yeshua and his disciples who bring his gospel message to the whole entire world with the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, period, point blank. Thank you so much. All right. With that being said, we're out of time, guys. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. I wish we had more time to do so. Uh, but I can do five it. more minutes. I can do five more minutes if you're down and your hood is down. Are you down? Yeah, yeah. what's up? I, we okay. can do five more minutes of questions if they come back. Just because everybody's hanging out, they're enjoying it. I can do five more minutes of questions. All right. You got any, Avery? Yeah, there was one about... Uh, yeah, I got there, five more minutes. There's one about... Okay. There's one about... Um, let me see if I can go back to it then. Uh, <clears throat> well, basically, it was in the about the eternal Messiah in the Pesita... Pesita Rabati? Yeah. And, he's, and he was asking Yehuda, how does he reconcile... How does he reconcile his 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 theology with when or or you know when it talks about the Messiah being eternal in that source? Yeah, I mean God created all things, right? So the idea is that when the Messiah is anointed at the end of days, right? David their king, he will be our eternal Messiah forever. There's no problem with that. Um, I don't have a problem with an eternal Messiah. For me, the Messiah always existed, second person of the triune God. Not a problem for me for the Messiah to be eternal. But I think that this does, if I may, just for 10 seconds, this does show a little bit of an issue and a problem. It shows the inconsistency of rabbinic Judaism and approaching the Hebrew Bible through the lens of rabbinic literature. As a Messianic Jew, we use rabbinic literature as part of our worldview and part of the way we see the world, but it is not the final determining factor. What is authoritative 100% is the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Do we operate in the traditions of Israel? Absolutely. But they don't bring any truth to the Bible that we cannot already find from Scripture. Rather, they are contradicting one another at many different points in the image of the Messiah. And this is what my friend Yehuda and others who are in the rabbinic worldview cannot plainly see that the Messiah did indeed come 2,000 years ago. His name is Yeshua, and he brought redemption for the whole world. All right. And so we also have right here, can you explain what it means to be the son of David? Please be concise, Yehuda, please. Concise answers, please. It means you have patrilineal lineage, right, going back to King David, which is why Jesus is immediate. This isn't the topic of the debate, but since we're talking about eternal messiahs and things that have nothing to do with what the topic is, Jesus is disqualified from being Mashiach simply based off the fact that, according to the New Testament, he had some sort of virgin birth, right? That would completely be—show me an example of a king of Israel or Judah who was— based on their maternal lineage, right? Ex ex exclusively based on that. You can't show it because it's not, through the father is how we establish tribal lineage. So that has to be first established. So that's how you become a son of David. To be the son of David, you gotta fulfill the messianic prophecies, which is why we look at Hosea chapter three, verses four and five, and a, verse five says explicitly that he will come at the end of days, not before the destruction of the second temple, and as we mentioned before, Daniel 9 does not give any indication that this Mashiach who was cut off is exclusive to the Messiah, son of David, and can only be the Messiah, son of David. Not to thank mention you. the fact that the new covenant was not fulfilled. And thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi. So exactly what people are saying in the chat. People know the answers that we have many scenarios. Um, I mean, well, you know, many might be a little bit more, but we have scenarios where daughters receive the inheritance of what should have only been allowed to sons, which does, which shows that there is not a static eternality of even specific commandments 
in the Mosaic law, which shows that you have to operate in the governing covenant, like I said from the beginning, which is what is happening in the time period as Yeshua received this. And it's not like the Hebrew, the New Testament was caught off guard by the birth of the Messiah. It says that a son would be born to a virgin. And even it's interesting in the Hebrew Bible that it has a closed mem in the middle of Limar Bay. And many rabbinic sources say that this shows a closed womb, as a matter of fact. So it just shows a, a lack of familiarity with the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and the rabbinic sources. Thank you so much. Uh, another question for Yehuda, going back to Daniel 9. Um, if you're saying that it's not necessary for uh, the Messiah at that time to be the, you're, you're saying the son of uh, Joseph? Is that what you're saying? Or no, son of David. I'm saying that the word Mashiach, I, I, I've said this like you said it. You're saying it's not exclusive the to the son of Mashiach, David, right? Never. You can. I would challenge anyone to show me in the Tanakh, Jew or Christian, to show me where the Hebrew word Mashiach is used to exclusively, exclusively operative word here, refer to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. Got you. Got you. So, what the 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 question here is? Um, so you you do acknowledge that this does give the time frame in the first century for a Messiah to appear, correct? A Messiah is a pretty generic concept, right? Because in Daniel 9, 20, 25, Mashiach refers to a Gentile king named Cyrus, who was referred in the book of Isaiah as Lim Shicho, as God's Mashiach, right? Yeah, yeah so do you, do, you agree, do you agree that a Messiah appears in the first century? Is what when you say Mashiach, remember, that is not referring to a exclusively davidic king it can refer to a gentile king it can i understand i understand you I, uh, the the question yeah. is look I, I understand what you're saying yes. it, it can, it's a general term i'm asking yeah. you do you affirm that a messiah does appear in the first you century according to messiah. daniel i'm saying the word mashiach that is the hebrew word being used here right mm -hmm. i don't want people to get confused because you're using a messiah i'm saying a anointed something, someone, it is an extremely general word, and Christians are abusing the context, and literally the KJV says the Messiah. That is not the correct understanding by rabbis or the Tanakh, okay? Does, does, not, it, does, yeah. does, it, does Daniel 9 say that a Messiah will appear in the first century? You're using the word Messiah, and so I- the word Messiah not, is there. The word Mashiach is there, not Messiah. You're uh, you're understanding the word Messiah because it is used colloquially. Is today. Mashiach not Messiah? When we say the Messiah, right? Usually, in the colloquial context that we understand it, it means the Messiah, son of David. What I am saying is that as who? Word, what? Says well, I'm saying, I'm saying, like you're 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 saying that greater consciousness of society. When you hear the word Messiah, you usually assume that it means the Messiah, son of David. So I'm is there a poll that you did to get this information? Yeah. I'm just wondering where you're deriving. Reality, is there a poll reality, you did to say or, generally people do reality. that? Reality, and when I hear Christians and Jews use the word, so, Messiah, oh, your experience, they your experience, mean that it's referring to the Messiah, son of David. If you live on, so a this is your experience. Planet, and that's not your experience. Then good for you. But I'm so this is your experience. The reality of the audience that the word. So Mashiach, tell me what the Bible says, not your experience. The Bible says the word Mashiach, and I'm telling you according which means, to the Bible, which means you no know, anointed something. It doesn't have to mean a human. It means being. Messiah. It means Messiah, my friend. Mashiach means, means Messiah. Mashiach can refer to an anointed high priest. It can refer to anointed vessels in the temple. <sighs> It can refer to all of these things. So the word is Messiah, though, right? And you try to manipulate the language to make you, you, sure Yehuda, the, 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 the word is Messiah, right? Thing, Yehuda? Right? Sorry? Yehuda, the word is Messiah, right? It, the word is, is Messiah, Mashiach right? in Hebrew. That okay. is the word. Got you. No problem. So does it say that a Mashiach will appear in the first century? Yes. Okay. And it says that this Mashiach will be cut off, right? Not for his own sins. It says, "Will be no more." It says, "Mashiach Yikrat." Right? We, we know the verse, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, is that talking about? Is that what? 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 Mashiach appeared in the first century and took the sins of of the people. Right. So once off. again, because it's such a generic word, right? It could refer to a high priest at the time. It could refer to. Yeah, I'm asking who. Himself. I'm asking who was it? Well, I'm saying it doesn't have to even refer to a who. 
it's a generic word, so it gives us room for interpretation, right? So if I asked you who is the oppressive individual who's going to oppress the, the holy ones of the Most High in Daniel 7.25, can you tell me specifically who that is and give me the exact... Okay. So Sheikh, Sheikh, his answer is he doesn't know. Right, because nobody can. Because you read the Torah Mashiach and the Bible there. through a lens of the, the rabbis. Mashiach this is there. why you don't know. The word Mashiach. This is why you don't know. I know who it is. Used in the Tanakh, this would be the only instance in the entirety of the Tanakh, and this is he what doesn't know. Mean. Show me anywhere else where the word Mashiach is used to refer to the Messiah, Son of David, and no one else. Wow. Uh, the only pass, the only passage. All right, let me respond now. Let me respond. The only passage where we're told that Mashiach will do anything. Remember the difference between a verb and a noun. Mashiach, Mashiach, hifil form. It has a yud inside the middle of it, showing an individual, a thing, an object. Okay, this is Hebrew. So when it says the priest Messiah uses Mashiach, you can. It'll be okay to translate it Messiah priest. So we're seeing these anointed individuals pointing forward to one thing, right? Which is the Messiah. Even our own sages. Have have told us all the prophets prophesied only for the days of Mashiach. This is what we're looking forward to. So it's always looking forward to him. The context of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 is that there is one individual who will expiate sin. And it is so sad that you are about to shoot, not that you're about to shoot, but you're about to shoot. You go to synagogue, you do Havdalah, you celebrate Shabbat, and you can't even tell me who the individual is that God took time for to solidify for Daniel. Give him this revelation. It's a monumental thing. It's a marker in time for the Jewish people based upon her sins and rebellion and you as a rabbinic modern orthodox jew don't know who it is it is a because sad thing i'm crying on the inside fully radar it's mashiach it's is a, a rock word. is it a bone it could is it a chicken is it a chicken refer, nugget what is it it can refer to not just it's the context of the word mashiach as we described earlier in daniel 9 yes in daniel 9 and verse 25 the is mashiach, it referring to an object or a person so in mashiach Verse, uh, sorry, in the Mashiach in Daniel 9, 24, for example, mm. when, or sorry, 25, where it refers to the Mashiach Nagid, right? We mm. understand that to refer to Cyrus, the Gentile king, right? So this is how we understand that the word is not exclusive to even, in this case, I, I, it's not I, I understand. Look, Yehuda, I understand what you're saying. My, my yes. question is, according to the context of the Mashiach, who's bearing the sins of the people, and who is the prince, according to Daniel 9, the Mashiach that appears in the first century is a person, correct? Where did no, where does it sit? Not necessarily. It okay, says, so where do you where do you get any idea that the Mashiach that appears in Daniel 9 is not a person? So there's two Mashiachs, right? I don't have a problem with it being a person. It could very well be the high priest, it could very well be the you know <laughs> ruling dignitary at the time, right? But when it comes to what is happening in that verse, the word Mashiach, right, is so, for example, when you look at the word Mashiach in Daniel 9, 25, it says, you shall know and understand from the time and the emergence, the word to restore Jerusalem until the anointed king, right? So we understand this as King Cyrus, because that was when the word was to restore Jerusalem. That's very specific. But when you look at Daniel 9, 26, right, it simply says that a Mashiach will be cut off. And will be no more. That's all it says. For it's why? For, for what reason? For what reason? It's simply explaining that this is going to represent the destruction of the temple and how there's going to be a process of time where we're going to go. It explains we go into exile and does then. It, does it mention that not for his own sins? Or am I it tripping? It says he will be no more, right? It says he will be no more. So Does it say why? Does it say why? It simply says that he will be cut off and he will be no more. And the people of the coming monarch will destroy the city. It says it's going to represent when the people are going to come and destroy the sanctuary. It says it explicitly. R Rabbi Eduardo, does it mention why he's going to be cut off? So Is it's it it's uh, so I mean, plainly it says 70 weeks of decree for your people. And what's going to happen? To finish transgression, make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, seal of vision, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Mm -hmm. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince, so we're not talking about rocks. Rocks don't become princes. 
Chicken nuggets don't become princes. Tables don't become princes. Not inanimate objects don't become princes. It's a person who is to come will destroy the city. Okay, we're not talking about rain. It's not hail. It's not a storm. There's a person, an individual, a specific individual who will come. He will destroy the city, and his end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there'll be war, desolation, determined. Right, and the, so we have a prince here, an individual prince who's going to come. We have the individual Messiah talking about these individuals and interacting with each other. But there's the Messiah, the prince in 25. It is one individual, the Nagid. There's not multiple. Not multiple of them. There is one. We have to understand. It says, and he and the prince who's going to come after is going to make a firm covenant. There is one individual who is the Mashiach in this passage that God takes much time to meet with Daniel and share with him about what's about to happen. It is vital in history. He's not talking about some random thing that's going to happen at a random grocery store one day that no one cares about. This time period of the cutting off the Messiah and the expiation of sin is the most pivotal point for the Jewish people in the history of the world and redemption for humanity. And it finds a fulfillment in the giving of Messiah Yeshua. Right. So one last thing regarding the new covenant of Jeremiah, right? So my opponent already stated that he believes that the initiation of this new covenant was with the cutting off of this Mashiach described in Daniel 9.26 and described in Daniel 9.24. The purpose is, is earlier in the debate, we discussed the new covenant and how both in Ezekiel 36 and in Deuteronomy 30, which describes God putting the covenant of our hearts, which was, describes the new covenant of Jeremiah, where we won't have to teach each other to know the Lord, that will happen after the final exile, not before the destruction of the second temple. So that's why I pointed this out. Sin still exists in the world, right? If my opponent wants to say that Jesus being killed on the cross, initiated the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, then we have to acknowledge that it did not get rid of sin. And we are still trying to teach each other to know the law, which proves we're still under the Mosaic covenant and not under the new covenant of, of uh, Jeremiah. So we are still operating under the Mosaic covenant by the simple merit that we are still teaching each other, just as it says in the Via Hafta, which every Orthodox Jew knows by heart. I would challenge you to find any Jew who doesn't know What is this? What is a shachrit, bro? What are you doing, bro? What Come did on, I man. say? I quoted from. No, Hebrew. I know what it is. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and might. Exactly. And it goes on to say, yeah, words, exactly. I know what the Via Hafta is, but it's not Shachri, bro. You didn't have to do that. They shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them to your children. And just as we are teaching each other now, which proves we are under the Mosaic covenant and not the new covenant, because under the new covenant, we will not have to teach each other because it will happen after the final exile. Gotcha, that gotcha. God will bring all gotcha. of the knowledge of God to the world. And gotcha, Jesus gotcha. You, on the cross I got you. I got you, Yehuda. You're like, uh, I got you. I know I got you, you want me to stop talking because. Well, no, because you, you were, you were like basically just on a. On no, a, you I'm were not demonstrating it. what we all know to be true. So. All right. All right. No, so, I, I don't know about all that, bro. All right. Okay, so, so you, we you wanted, you wanted, you wanted to say something uh, earlier, Rabbi. I heard, yeah. I saw, I um, so, saying. I can give a real clear refutation of his thing. Um, rewind the cross exam. And he said that we must operate in the covenant that is existing at the time. Daniel 9, 24, 27 tells us we're in that time period. It's evident. It's a fact. Yehuda can say no all he wants, and he can jump up and down and shout Hebrew liturgy all day. Um, he can do that if he wants to. Um, it's not impressive to anybody. Look at the English, the plain meaning of the passage, and you will see that the timeline for the Messiah, we are in, brothers and sisters. And this is good news. That's why it's called the gospel. We're in the time of the Messiah right now. Come to him, be born again, receive the Holy Spirit, receive new life, be reconciled to God. And this is what it is. Yehuda himself agreed. We cannot go back to other covenants. We can't hop in the DeLorean and go back to the Mosaic covenant. We can't hop in the DeLorean and go back to the Abrahamic covenant. We must operate in the governing covenant. If that's the only thing that you get from this debate, we must operate in the governing covenant from Yehuda's mouth himself. He said it's ridiculous to think that Abraham would engage with God the way he engaged with Adam, the same way that he engaged with Moses. It would be ridiculous to think that Moses is going to engage in the covenant of Abraham. They stack on each other and you must be in keeping with the present covenant and the governing covenant today is the covenant of the blood of Messiah Yeshua. Embrace him now. Today's the moment. Today's the day of salvation. Amen. All right. Well, with that being said, I, that was fun. That was a fun, fun exchange. We have to do this again, Yehuda. You got to come back yeah, yeah. and and maybe do a, even part two on this section where it's not really much 
it's it's more like this where you're you guys right. can actually have just a full-on discussion yeah, I got without any time constraints on that thank you thank you so much <laughs> yeah this was it was fun man it, it was really uh pleasant to thank have you, so you here i i enjoyed your passion bro so uh keep it and i, I do pray for you and um please come back like we got to schedule this again for our actual discussion because i want to see this like i'm serious i want to see this soon so um just let me know guys if you guys are up to it and we'll, we'll get it going yeah. with that being said subscribe to yehuda israel if you want to see his uh you know his videos and his is uh him express his theology um and his rebuttals to you know uh christianity and things of this nature Subscribe to Radar Apologetics, who does this on a regular. He does this in his sleep, where he deals with rabbinic Judaism or Orthodox Judaism um, and bringing the truth of our Lord uh, Yeshua. Um, and then subscribe here also, if you have not already, for more of these type of discussions, more of these exchanges, uh, and, and so that we can learn together, grow together, and sharpen our iron for the glory and kingdom of God our Savior. Amen. With that Amen. being said, there's only one God who is triune. Stay away from Islam, and abortion is murder. You all take care and be blessed. It's God.